I once had the experience of entering a cave for the very first time in my life. Along the tour, the guide decided to switch off all the lights. And I immediately put my hand in front of my face to see if I could see my hand. I could see none of it. After a few minutes, the uh, tour guide finally switched all the lights back on and you should have heard the echoes of relief from many of the individuals in the crowd. It seems quite easy for us in this day and age to take lights for, a, for granted. We can switch lights on, we can switch them off. It's very easy for us to do that. But over a century ago, even here in this country, it wasn't quite that way. A person, in order to have some light, either needed a candle or they could use some kind of a lamp to be able to give light. They had no flashlights, they had nothing of that nature. Now, of course, the uh, candle was a little bit more difficult because if there was any wind, it'd blow the candle out. So, usually they used lamps, especially if they went out. They used to use kerosene lanterns, and before they came up with kerosene, the main use of oil, main, main use of power to power the lamps was oil. Whether it was animal oil or whether it was some kind of a vegetable oil, specifically olive oil. In Bible times, the olive oil was used quite extensively, and in the sanctuary service, the olive oil was exclusively used in the powering of the light in the sanctuary. Now due to the importance of light, this olive oil, especially in the Old Testament times, became to be known as a symbol of power. We have an example of this in Zechariah chapter 4. Zechariah chapter 4 verses 1 through 6 and then verse 12. It says, And the angel that talked with me came again and waked me, as a man that is wakened out of his sleep, and said unto me, What seest thou? And I said, I have looked, and behold, a candlestick, all of gold, with a bowl on top of it, and his seven lamps thereon, and seven pipes to the seven lamps, which are upon the top thereof, and two olive trees by it, one upon the right side of the bowl, and the other upon the left side thereof. So I answered and spake to the angel that talked with me, saying, What are these, my lord? Then the angel that talked with me answered and said unto me, Knowest thou not what these be? And I said, No, my Lord. And he answered and spake unto me, saying, This is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel, saying, Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. And now verse 12. And I answered again and said unto him, What be these two olive branches which through the two golden pipes empty the golden oil out of themselves? So we find here that light was being given on candlesticks, on these lamp stands, but this light was powered by something. That something was the oil that was flowing through the pipes to the olive tree. Now, we find here that this power, this power that this oil represented in verse 6, it says, not by might, nor by power, but by my Holy Spirit. And so we find that this oil is a symbol of the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, we take a look at the lamp itself. You find a lamp sitting there on a lamp stand. Now, the lamp by itself, does it have power? No, it doesn't. The, it's only when the oil fills the lamp that it does have power. The lamp is only a vessel. Now, as we study the Bible, we find that there is a symbolism for the lamp as well. Let's take a look at Psalm 119, verse 105. You may know the text. It says, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. So the word of God is symbolized by the lamp. So you take a look as we look at these passages here. You find that the lamp itself represents the Bible. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. But tell me something, the lamp by itself, does it have the power? We were studying quite a bit about the power of the word of God, but each study that we go into, we build upon the previous study. Now this Bible is very important. But without 
the oil, the lamp does not shine. And so you have the oil that goes inside the lamp, that gives it power, is not by might, nor by power, but by my Spirit, saith the Lord. So the oil represents the Holy Spirit. And without the aid of the Holy Spirit, we do not have power in the reading of the Scriptures. Sometimes the word, this power, you may not see the oil every single time. You often see the results of the oil. You see the light burning. You may not even see the lamps, lamp itself. You may not even see the oil in the lamp, but you see the results. And this is why when Jesus was talking about the Holy Spirit, He described it in that same way. Let's look at John chapter 3, verses 6 through 8. John chapter 3, verses 6 through 8. That which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I say unto thee, ye must be born again. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh, and whither it goeth. So is everyone that is born of the Spirit. So Jesus illustrates the power of the Holy Spirit. You cannot see where, where the Holy Spirit is. You cannot see the oil in the lamp, but you see the results. You see the results of the wind. And so then, who is this Holy Spirit? How important is He in the plan of salvation? Do we really need His work? Let us examine some of these questions in this particular lesson. Now, contrary to popular ideas, the Holy Spirit was not revealed for the first time on the day of Pentecost. Oh no, let us take a look at the very first two verses of the Bible. Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. It says, In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Right there at the very beginning, at the very beginning of the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit was introduced. Why is it that the Holy Spirit had to be introduced right there in the very beginning of the Bible? Who is this Holy Spirit that makes Him having to be way back there instead of on Pentecost? Let's take a look at Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 14. Hebrews 9 verse 14. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered Himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Notice it mentions here whom? It mentions through the eternal Spirit. So who is the Spirit? One of His characteristics is that He is eternal. So let us jot some of these characteristics down as we are studying about the Holy Spirit so we can be able to identify Him. In the first place, it is mentioned that the Holy Spirit is eternal. Eternal means there is no end and there is no beginning. And for this reason, the Holy Spirit was not only found on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit was present when this earth was being created. Why? Because the Holy Spirit is eternal. So like Christ, the Holy Spirit has always existed. We read in this very, we studied some things in this last lesson about the eternal nature of Jesus Christ. Well, this also makes the Holy Spirit the same as Jesus Christ, eternal in nature. Does this make Him God? Does the fact that He is eternal, does it make Him God? Well, let us take a look at some characteristics of the Holy Spirit that clearly identify the Holy Spirit as the third person of the Godhead. Let us take a look at Psalm 139, verses 7 through 12. Psalm 139, verses 7 through 12. Whither shall I go from thy spirit? Or whither shall I flee from thy presence? If I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. 
If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there shall thy hand lead me, and thy right hand shall hold me. If I say, Surely the darkness shall cover me, even the night shall be light about me. Yea, the darkness hideth not from thee, but the night shineth as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike unto thee. So here it says that the Holy Spirit, where can you hide from the Holy Spirit? You cannot hide from the Holy Spirit anywhere. For that reason, we can write down another characteristic of the Holy Spirit. And that characteristic, that He is present everywhere. So the Holy Spirit is not only eternal, but it is all present. We call the term omnipresent. He is present everywhere. Another characteristic of the Holy Spirit is that He knows everything. Let us look at 1 Corinthians 2, verses 9 through 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 9 through 12. But as it is written, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither had entered into the heart of man the things which God had prepared for them that love him. But God had revealed them unto us by his Spirit, for the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the Spirit of man which is in him? Even so the things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit of which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given us of God. So in this particular case, it says that the Holy Spirit knows all the things that God knows. For that reason, then, we can say that the Holy Spirit is all-knowing. The Holy Spirit is all-knowing. So the Holy Spirit knows everything. He is eternal. He is present everywhere and He knows everything. With such statements as these, it can only refer to one, to God in the fullest sense of the word. The Holy Spirit is God because He is eternal. He was involved in creation at the very beginning. He is present everywhere at the same time. He is all-knowing. And there is something else that the Holy Spirit has done. Let's take a look at 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 21. 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 21. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So holy men of God, they spoke as the Holy Spirit moved them. So it is the Holy Spirit that has inspired the writing of the Old Testament. And not only the Old Testament, let us take a look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, and let us take a look at verse 13. For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when ye received the word of God which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. So the Holy Spirit was the one that inspired the writing of both the Old Testament and the New Testament. So we can conclude from these texts that the Holy Spirit is God. Well, let us take a look and see, is the Holy Spirit a personal being? Now, there are certain traits that we can identify a personal being with. For example, a rock does not know. A rock cannot love because a rock is not a personal being. A rock is something there, but it is not personal. A rock cannot communicate with us. Only a personal being can communicate. And let us take a look at some characteristics of the Holy Spirit that are mentioned in the Bible that clearly show to us that the Holy Spirit is a personal being. First of all, in 1 Corinthians 2, 9 through 12, we just read there, the Holy Spirit knows. It says He knows everything. Well, let's just write that down on our new list here. In the first place, we're going to write down here that the Holy Spirit knows has the capability of knowing. Another characteristic is found in Romans 15 and verse 30. Romans chapter 15 and verse 30. It says, Now I beseech you, brethren, 
for the Lord Jesus Christ's sake and for the love of the Spirit that ye strive together with me in your prayers for me. Notice here, the love of the Spirit. This means that the Holy Spirit has a capability of loving. So we can put there that He loves. So the Holy Spirit has the capability to love. And this is important because this is showing the personal nature of the Holy Spirit. In 2 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 14, 2 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 14, we have another characteristic of the Holy Spirit. It says, The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all. Amen. So here it mentions, notice here, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Ghost. Why does he mention these three here? Because each of them, he is mentioning certain attributes of each of the deity. So here we find that the Holy Spirit is able to hold communion. The Holy Spirit is able to communicate. It is able to hold communion. This is a very important characteristic of the deity, of a personality. Also, we can take a look at 1 Timothy 4, verse 1. It says, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly, that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. So what is the Holy Spirit doing here? It says, The Holy Spirit speaketh expressly. So the Holy Spirit is able to speak. So we find here the Holy Spirit knows, the Holy Spirit loves, the Holy Spirit can communicate by speaking. He has holds communion and he's able to speak. These are all personal traits, traits of a personality. Another one we find is in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 13. Another important attribute of a personality. Which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Again, another characteristic here, the characteristic of being able to teach. So here again, another personal characteristic. He's able to teach. So the Holy Spirit is one that teaches. Now these are all personal characteristics. Let us take a look at a couple more here. Romans chapter 8 and verse 16. Romans chapter 8 and verse 16. It says, The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. What does it do? It bears witness. So this is again something a person that can witness is a person. A rock cannot witness. Something intangible, something non-existent. And so the Spirit is able to bear witness. And He's able to bear witness with us. So again, this shows the personal nature of the Holy Spirit. In Romans 8, 26 and 27, Romans 8, verse 26 and 27 says, Likewise the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is in the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. So he intercedes for us. So the Holy Spirit intercedes in behalf of the saints. So this again shows the personal nature of the Holy Spirit. And also in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 7 through 11. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. 
For to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom, to another the word of knowledge by the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another the gifts of healing by the same Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another diverse kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. But all these work at that one and self same Spirit, dividing to every man severally as he will. So we find here he is the distributor of the gifts. So he is the one that distributes these gifts. So he's the distributor of the gifts. So he's able to distribute the gifts of the Spirit to all. And a couple more. There's a couple more that show that he is a personal being. Let's look at Re Revelation 22 and verse 17. Revelation 22 and verse 17. And the Spirit and the Bride say, Come, and let him that heareth say, Come, and let him that is a thirst come, and whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. So you find here that the Spirit does what? It invites us to come to the Lord. So the Holy Spirit again is able to give a personal invitation. The Holy Spirit invites us. These are very important. Now, there's a couple more here. Let's look in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 13. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 13. It says, In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. What happened? Ye were sealed. So the Holy Spirit also here mentions He seals. Again, another personal characteristic. And because the Holy Spirit seals, we have a warning here. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 30. Ephesians 4 and verse 30. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. So because He seals, we should not grieve the Holy Spirit. Well, that means that the Holy Spirit can be grieved. Okay, so let us put that down also. The Holy Spirit can be grieved. Again, another characteristic of the Holy Spirit, a personal characteristic. So because the Holy Spirit is a personal being, Jesus applied the personal pronoun, he and him, to the Holy Spirit 24 times. An example of that is in John 14, verses 16 and 17. John chapter 14, verses 16 and 17. And I will pray the Father, and He shall give you another Comforter, that He may abide with you forever. Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth Him not, neither knoweth Him. But ye know Him, for He dwelleth with you, and shall be in you. So here again is mentioned the personal pronoun. It's also interesting here that the Holy Spirit is not Jesus. Because it says here, I will pray someone. He will pray to whom? He will pray to the Father. And the Father will send what? The Father will not come. It doesn't say He will come. But what? He will send someone. He will send whom? Jesus again? No. I will send, pray the Father, and He shall send another Comforter. So this shows that there's a distinction between the Father, there's a distinction between Jesus, and there's a distinction between the Holy Spirit. So although these are three distinct beings, they are all personal, they are all eternal, and they are all God. You may wonder, how can that be when we worship only one God? Well, the one God that we worship in the Bible in the Old Testament, the term for God is usually the term Elohim. It is very interesting that, that Elohim is in plural. Elohim is the plural form of Eloah. So when we read in the Old Testament, majority of times when you read the word God, it is speaking of God in a plural sense. 
So the God that we worship is a plural God. And we have the evidences of it being the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And this is why in the very beginning, in Genesis chapter 1, in Genesis chapter 1, we find the record of creation quite interesting. Verse 26, and God said, now keep in mind, this is God in the plural form, Elohim. And God said, let us make a man in our image after our likeness. So you find that there is a plural God that we worship. This plural God has a likeness and this plural God has an image. And this is why God here uses the term our image, our likeness. Now what is the work of the Holy Spirit? We looked at some characteristics we first of all identified the Holy Spirit as eternal God. Then we looked at that He's a personal being. He is able to know. He can love. He can have communion. He can speak. He can teach. He bears witness. He intercedes. He's a distributor of gifts. He invites. He seals. And He can be grieved. And Jesus Christ uses the term when He refers to the Holy Spirit as a personal pronoun, he and him. And of course, keep in mind, it's distinct from Jesus Christ. Now, what is the work of the Holy Spirit? Well, the Holy Spirit is the personal representative of Jesus Christ. Let's look at John chapter 15 and verse 26. John chapter 15 and verse 26. But when the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father. And this now, the last time it says, I'll pray the Father and He shall send you another Comforter. Well, the Father is going to be the one sending. This time it says, but when the Comforter is come, whom I will send. So Jesus does not send Himself. When you send someone, you send someone else. But when the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth which proceeded from the Father, He shall testify of me. So what is the work of the Holy Spirit? The work of the Holy Spirit is to testify of Jesus. So it's very plain from here that the one that is the personal representative of Jesus Christ is not a human being. The personal representative of Jesus Christ is the Holy Spirit on this earth. No one has an advantage by having someone that represents Christ quite close at hand. The Holy Spirit is present to be able to do that work. Now we have read that Christ is the intercessor. Let us take a look in 1 Timothy 2 verse 5 about that. 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 5. For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. So here it mentions that our mediator between God and man is Jesus Christ. So you have God up here, you have God, and then when we are as a man, as mankind we want to communicate with God. Well we have to go through a mediator. This is Jesus Christ. This Jesus Christ is the mediator. He is the one that stands between man and God. So this is why, as we studied in our last lesson, Jesus had to come down. He had to become man in order to be a proper mediator. He had to understand us. So with one hand, Jesus reaches us here as mankind. And with the other hand, Jesus reaches up and reaches God. Because Jesus is the combination of both God and man. And so when we communicate to God, we communicate through Jesus Christ as the mediator. It says, for there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. But this Holy Spirit is also a mediator. We just read that a little while ago, Romans chapter 8 and verse 26. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, 
For we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now, it says in Timothy that Jesus is the only mediator between God and man. And now here we find that the Holy Spirit is interceding between us and God. What does that mean? Let's look at verse 34. Verse 34, speaking about Jesus, it says, Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God. So speaking about Jesus, what did he do? He died, he is risen again, and is there in the right hand of God. But now notice the next part there. Who also maketh intercession for us. Notice the term also. When it says here, he also maketh intercession, that means that there's someone else that makes intercession because it was mentioned earlier in that same chapter. And in that chapter it talks about the Holy Spirit intercedes for us. So Jesus Christ intercedes also for us, but in 1 Timothy we read that he is the only mediator between God and man. Well, how do we reconcile that? Well, we obviously find that the work of mediation of Jesus and the mediation of the Holy Spirit are two different types of mediation. What does the Holy Spirit do? In verse 26 it says, Likewise the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. So what does the Holy Spirit do? It helps our infirmities. So the intercessory work of the Holy Spirit is not to intercede between God and man. No, He doesn't do that. His intercessory work is different than that of Jesus Christ. Jesus is the only mediator between God and man. The Holy Spirit is the one that intercedes by, by working with us. It says here, he helps our infirmities because we don't even know what to pray for. So when we are praying to God, we don't know how to pray. So we need the Holy Spirit to intercede in our behalf, to help us, to help our infirmities. But directly between God and man, when we need intercession, when we need mediation for our sins, we have Jesus Christ. Now, we'll study in the future lesson a little bit more about the detailed work of the Holy Spirit and why it's dangerous to grieve Him. Now, in the previous chapter, we saw Jesus, the Creator of heaven and earth. He became man. He did not make believe man, but He really became one of us. In doing so, when He became one of us, He became like unto, uh, made like unto His brethren. He became like one of us. Then Jesus made a tremendous sacrifice. The tremendous sacrifice that Jesus made was that when He cumbered Himself with humanity, He cannot be everywhere at one time. And it is for this reason in John chapter 16 and verse 7, John chapter 16, and verse 7, we find the purpose of the Holy Spirit. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. The purpose of the Comforter is because, as we read earlier, he can be everywhere. And this is why we need the Holy Spirit everywhere. Jesus could no longer be everywhere. Now when the Spirit will come, what will He do? What does He do in this whole plan of redemption? John chapter 16 and verse 8, the very next verse. And when He is come, He will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. The marginal reading for reprove is convince. So His work is to convince us that we are sinning. So since conviction or convincing is one of the very first steps in repentance and conversion, the Holy Spirit has a very important work in applying Christ's sacrifice and atonement to, our person, to us personally. Now there's the, Holy, the Holy Spirit also has a relationship to the church of God. In John chapter 16 verse 13 we read, Howbeit when He the Spirit of truth is come, He will guide you into all truth. 
Now, how much truth will the Holy Spirit guide us into? It says into all truth. Now today, as we look around us, we find so many different denominations, so many different beliefs, so many different ideologies, and, we, and everyone is claiming to be the Church of God. How do we know which is the Church of God? How do we know what doctrines to believe? How do we know what is right and what is wrong? Let us take a look at 1 Timothy 3, verse 15. 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 15. But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. The church is the pillar and ground of the truth. So if the church is the pillar and ground of the truth, and the Holy Spirit is to guide us into all truth, then the Holy Spirit will guide us to the church of God. Since the Holy Spirit is going to guide us into the church of God, how important then it is for us, before we make a decision on what is the church and what is not the church, we need to have and pray for the guidance of the Holy Spirit. We need the help of the Holy Spirit in making such an important decision. In summarizing this whole matter about the Holy Spirit, we can say that the Holy Spirit is a personal being who cares for each and every one of us. The Holy Spirit cares for us because it says there in 2 Corinthians 5.19 that it was God that was, that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto Himself. So the Holy Spirit was there involving the, this reconciliation. And David understood that very clearly, the important role of the Holy Spirit in the plan of redemption. This is why in Psalm 51 verses 10 and 11, Psalm 51 verses 10 and 11, when we read about the prayer of David about the need of conversion, he says, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. And now notice verse 11, Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Notice here, what was his concern? His concern was, Please do not take away the Holy Spirit from me. That's right. He created me a clean heart, O oh God. Renew a right spirit within me and take not away your Holy Spirit. David realized the importance of the need of the Holy Spirit in his own personal life. For this reason, the gospel, as it was being preached to those souls that are in need, how are we to preach it to them? 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 12. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 12. Unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves, but unto us that they minister the things which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven, which things the angels desire to look into. So we are to preach the gospel with the Holy Ghost. We need the Holy Spirit with us in order to share the gospel with the world. I would just like to, as we come near the conclusion here, I would like to read two things, one from the Bible and one from this very wonderful book again. I'd like to read again from Desire of Ages. I read it a few times from there. I want to read it again from here. In Desire of Ages, page 671. Desire of Ages, page 671. A beautiful summary of the Holy Spirit. It says, in describing to His disciples the office work of the Holy Spirit, Jesus sought to inspire them with a joy and hope that inspired His own heart. He rejoiced because of the abundant help He had provided for His church. The Holy Spirit was the highest of all gifts that He could solicit from His Father for the exaltation of His people. The Spirit was to be given as a regenerating agent and without this, the sacrifice of Christ would have been of no avail. The power of evil had been strengthening for centuries, and the submission of men to this satanic captivity was amazing. Sin could be resisted and overcome only through the mighty agency of the third person of the Godhead, who would come with no modified energy, but in the fullness of divine power. It is the Spirit that makes effectual what has been wrought out by the world's Redeemer. It is by the Spirit that the heart is made pure. Through the Spirit the believer becomes a partaker of the divine nature. Christ has given His Spirit as a divine power to overcome all hereditary and cultivated tendencies of evil and to impress His own character upon His church. I thought this paragraph summarized really beautifully all the statements that we've been reading about. 
So in conclusion, I'd like to read one statement from Luke chapter 11, verses 9 through 13. Luke chapter 11, verses 9 through 13. And this is what the Heavenly Father is appealing for each one of us. Luke chapter 11, verses 9 through 13. And I say unto you, Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth, and to him that knocketh it shall be opened. If a son shall ask bread of any of you that is a father, will he give him a stone? Or if he asks a fish, will he for a fish give him a serpent? Or if he shall ask an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask Him? The heavenly Father is eager to send His Holy Spirit to each one of us. Do you feel the need of the Holy Spirit? Is all the things that we've been reading about, do you realize that need that the Holy Spirit is necessary in your life to help you to make this Word of God come to life? Well, the appeal that is mentioned here by Jesus is that we need to ask for the Holy Spirit. My question to you is, are you ready to ask for the Holy Spirit right now?